Now I want to talk about what we've been moving toward, and that is a leader. Now in the Bible, the word leader um, is actually a fairly specific term. And in Hebrews chapter 13, the word leader in English is, uh, it occurs three times. The Greek word is the Greek word hegemon. And in Greek, this person generally was some kind of a provincial governor, a chief, some kind of a commander. It was some kind of an official leadership position. And so this is the word that's used in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, remember your leaders. And then in Hebrews 13, 17, a very important verse, obey your leaders and submit to them. And then Hebrews 13, 24, greet your leaders. Same Greek word referring to this next type of person, and that is a person who's appointed to leadership. And one of my favorite passages in the Bible that talks about this appointment by the church of leaders is Acts chapter 6. And I believe that it's obvious from Stephen, who is one of these leaders who was appointed, that these leaders who were appointed by the church to care for the widows of that church in Jerusalem, these were people who were already learners. They were already laboring. And now they were given an appointment by the church for responsibility. And so we read in Acts chapter 6, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. And we will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. And this proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and, and the Holy Spirit. Also Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenius and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. And they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. And so the word of God spread and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. But I want you to notice here that there's a flow, there's a progression. When it comes to the learner, we're learning together one-on-one. -on -one. When it comes to the laborer, we are with a shepherd and his sheep. But now when it comes to the position of a leader in the local church, Hebrews says that, we're to be very careful to remember, to obey, to greet leaders. And so they have to be qualified. Not everybody should be a leader. Because if we put a person into leadership who really isn't worthy of being obeyed, that's one of the reasons why churches have terrible problems. Because they put into positions of leadership mere spiritual children people who really aren't a true learner, people who really haven't labored and led and tried to help sheep. They're just made a leader, and they think they have all kinds of authority, and it can go to their head, and they can actually be destructive to a church. And so Scripture is very careful to talk about the qualifications of a leader, and that's the big difference, really, between a laborer and a leader. 
A leader is someone who's appointed by the church and we are to obey them in their ministry. A laborer is just anybody who might be leading sheep. So what is our profile of a leader? Well, I want to suggest to you that in 1 Timothy chapter 3, as we have a description of deacons and deaconesses, there's a clear profile of what a person should be who's given and appointed to a position of leadership in the local church. First, 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 and 9 says that deacons are to be worthy of respect. In the same way, the women, some interpret that to be the deacon's wife, some, to, some interpret that to be the deaconess, are to be women worthy of respect. Now, this word worthy of respect doesn't mean that you're perfect. But what it means is that there is no charge against the person. Worthy of respect means that nobody can point to that leader and say, you know, they, out, in the, out in their job, they cheat people. Nobody can point to that person and say, you know, they're really a terrible husband or they're a terrible wife. So it's not that we're perfect, but that there's no charge of disobedience to Christ that's damaging other people that can be made against us. And then the profile of a leader, according to 1 Timothy 3, is that they must be tested, especially in relation to drink, drinking, dollars, the use of money, and debate how we control our tongue. And so in 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 to 13, deacons likewise are to be men worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, their wives are to be women of worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. The deacon must be the husband of but one wife and must manage his children and his household well. And those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 to 13. I want to highlight three areas. First, what is our tongue like? Do we speak sincerely? Do we gossip? How do we do when it comes to our tongue? Now, this word carries with it the understanding of not being double-tongued. In America, the American Indians, when the white man came, they used to say that White man speaks with forked tongue. That he would say one thing to one person and one thing to another person. White man speaks with forked tongue rather than sincere, saying the same thing to everyone. And I remember once in our church, we had a very controversial issue and one person on the side asked me, what do you think, Rick, about this? And I told him one thing. And then somebody else asked me, what do you think? And I changed it a little bit. And I told that person something else. And somebody came and confronted me and said, Rick, you're double-tongued. And I had to ask his forgiveness. And ever since then, I've really tried to be careful to say the same thing to every person because that's where it's really the safest. And if we start saying different things to different people, then we're really not ready to be a leader. And we'll really get ourselves in trouble. And we'll have to ask forgiveness and we'll have to change quickly or people will lose respect for us. And notice that we have to ask, how are we doing with the use of alcohol? We're going to spend some extended time on this question, but notice here that Scripture doesn't say that a leader cannot drink alcohol. It says that the leader must not indulge. The word literally means to be alongside of wine, alcohol, so that they're characterized 
in the same way that I might have a cup of coffee all the time. If a person's characterized and is always drinking alcohol every day, there's a problem. And then what is your use of money? What's your reputation in terms of are you honest in the way that you handle the financial resources? Are you generous in giving to the church? A leader is to be tested in the area of drinking, in the area of dollars, in how they debate, how they use their tongue. And then the profile of a leader is we must hold to the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. Now, this is a big difference between an elder and a, and a leader, between a pastor and a deacon. And that is that the deacon is to hold to the deep truths of the faith, where the pastor or the elder must be able to teach those truths. Now, not every leader is a great teacher in a Sunday school, but at least one-on-one, -on -one, a leader ought to be able to defend that Christ is true man and true God. The Bible is the word of God and also written by men like Matthew, Luke, and John. We must be able to articulate why we believe that God is sovereign and yet we are also responsible for every choice we make. We need to be able to talk about the ministries of the Holy Spirit. These are the deep truths of the faith. And what this refers to is it refers to that which is revealed to us by Scripture and we don't know just by common sense or by seeing it in nature. Truths like the Trinity might be reflected in our world. St. Patrick supposedly pointed to a three-leaf clover to expa explain the Trinity. But the Trinity is revealed to us in God's Word. The nature of Scripture is revealed truth. It's a, a revealed mystery. We can not figure these things out by ourselves. And this is one of the things that a leader must do is they must have studied Scripture, know the core truths of the Christian faith. TVS Seminary is a great way to invest in the kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support this effective educational and outreach ministry today. We exist upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. So we've seen that leaders need to hold to the deep truths of the revealed faith of the Word of God. And leaders also need to be a good manager of their own family. Now, Scripture says a deacon must be the husband of but one wife and manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. A child was uh, being baptized as a young, younger man, and he was on his way home with his parents, and he was in the back seat of the car, and he began to cry, and sob. And his father turned and talked to him and said, what's the matter, son? And he said, well, the preacher said that he wanted me to be raised in a Christian home. And I really like you guys. Meaning that he was afraid that he wasn't in a Christian home. And so one person has said, if your Christianity does not work at home, please do not export it. So it's very important that those who would lead in the local church have to have a real faith, a real family, and that means problems along the way. I've served in leadership and there came a season when one of our children was struggling and I had to go to our leaders and say, I'm not sure if I can continue to be involved in ministry. And so I had to really focus on this child and by God's grace, he did turn around and today, all three of our children are walking with the Lord. They love Him. We're in good communication with them, all by God's grace. So it's not that we haven't had problems through the years. We've had many, many problems. But 
A leader does have to be able to manage those problems if they're going to manage the problems in the local church. And if we need to have a period of time where we focus on our family and we stop being involved in ministry, that can be very, very healthy because those who would lead must manage their own home well. So we've looked at the leadership skill then of making disciples, especially one-on-one meeting with a person and helping them to grow as we grow. We've looked at small groups where shepherds lead sheep and the importance of having help like a host home and the importance of apprenticing at the same time that we are learning how to shepherd other people and labor in the harvest. We've looked at leaders in the church and this is important because those who are appointed to a leadership position are those that have to have be worthy of respect and be the kind of person that other Christians want to really follow and obey in terms of what they're expected to do. And then the leadership skill of developing leaders is that one of the ways that leaders develop best is to do it as a community of leaders. And so it's very common in in churches that I know that are healthy for maybe every quarter, uh, three or four times a year, for those who are the, the shepherd, the laborers, and for those who are the leaders to gather together. And perhaps on a Saturday, the pastor talks about the vision of the church, where we're going, and then someone else provides training in a skill area, how to be a better listener, how to ask good questions, how to delegate to other people, how to study the Bible more deeply, maybe some particular doctrinal issue like the Trinity. And so leaders can learn together in what is sometimes called a leadership community. And this is one of the things that really helps to develop a church. 